welcome to the hey. Pettit, <laughs> Pettitshire Pen Pals. Yeah, <laughs> here we are. Pals the Pettit. <laughs> Showing off our pandemic chic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> My name is Antonio. And I am Nathaniel. And we are brothers with each other. We are brothers with each other. And we're coming to you actually here. We do it now that we've introduced ourselves. Okay. We can reveal who the true villains okay. are. Okay, <laughs> yes. Hey! Hi, Antonio. So, uh, <laughs> uh, Mai, you can, uh, you can uh, uh, <laughs> doff your mask as well if you wish. Okay, I'm Linda Pettit, and I'll take the mask off because I'm going to be reading, and it works better if I don't have a mask on. Yes, it sure does. And we're very uh, very delighted to have you again uh, reading our uh, narration of the Lights in the Old Fort novel, which is what we have deck on, <coughs> excuse me, on deck for today. Um, and so let's see, for those who are just joining us for the first time, um, where are we leaving off? Uh, last week we uh, started an adventure. Um, a a Antonio and Nathaniel, the brothers, um, made their way up to a, a spooky abandoned fort, Fort Bowden. Um, and what did they find, Dan? Well, uh, they found an old military, old abandoned military, well, <laughs> to all appearances, abandoned military fort. Uh, and um, it was very mysterious. And within that military fort, they found a box of what appeared to be electoral ballots for the election ballots. that was happening the next day. Are you sure they were ballots? Pretty sure. Um, so uh, uh, we we that got our our uh, our, our fur all uh, ruffled, and so we rush back home to go tell our parents about it. Um, why don't you walk us through that? Uh, we walked home and told our parents, and they were a little bit surprised that we'd gotten up into an abandoned fort. Um, and we discovered a clue while we were up there, which was a note um, that had several um, men who were only referred to by their initials talking about some uh, suspicious activities, or so it mm -hmm. might seem. Uh, so we consulted with the folks, and uh, they assured us that we shouldn't get into any um, trouble. Um, don't, and, go start, don't, don't go turning over any apple carts. Right. So uh, they agreed to get a head start on the next day, go to bed, and um, to here we are joining the Pettit Brothers on a trip down to downtown Jetty Bay. The next day. Uh, this is the, the next, next day. day, in the morning. And yep. uh, here we go. Now, um, if, brother, if you could tap dance for just a moment, I'd like to make sure that mom has a script. Okay. <laughs> uh, yes, I'd like to have that, too. <laughs> <laughs> it, it is good, yes. We're reading. So, uh, again, for those who didn't join us last week or who are just joining in now, um, we are reading this from the novelization of a podcast. Um, so, Pot Lights in the Old Fort was a podcast project we produced in 2018. Uh, it's currently available on brothercast.net. Um, it's a symphonic adventure. Um, story that uh, includes a cast of 37 characters, um, a full symphonic soundtrack that takes uh, place in 1927, uh, so the music is pretty exciting and adventurous. Um, yeah, and it's just this wonderful mosaic of uh, the community around us during that time in our lives, and uh, we like the story so much, we decided that we would come and uh, uh, convert it, the script into a novel. Um, so that is uh, Lights in the Old Fort. Um, it's roughly based on kind of, um, Dan and I really like uh, old Hardy Boys, uh, Nancy Drew kind of young adult fiction, yeah. and um, this is our kind of stab at, at writing a novel like that. So, here we go. Chapter 5, Jetty Bay Marina Boardwalk. I bet you I could catch 10 frogs and teach them all how to jump on a track. The fan muses. And then we could have races. The early morning sunshine makes the bay seem chipper and crisp as the boys make their way to the train station downtown. A long boardwalk follows the contours of the town's trusty seawall. It runs from the marina past the small shops and stalls facing the waterfront and stretches as far down the coast as the lighthouse on the south side. The boardwalk will take the boys most of the way to the train station. Each footstep on the boardwalk echoes with a dull, woody thud. Well, that's true. Antonio affirms. You could give them some of the bugs in your terrarium as prizes for the winter. Nah, I'd just dig up some old worms in the backyard. He continues. 
Or we could buy some night crawlers at Jimmy's Bait Shop. Well, that'll get him moving. Antonio agrees with a chuckle. The waves lap softly against the barnacle-covered pilings and the pebbly shore beneath them. Walls above the bay circle the fishing boats floating out to sea on the day's adventures, hoping to snag an easy meal. The just risen sun in the cloudless sky delicately tickles the surface of a calm blue sea. The sandals' attention turns to a handful of people gathered around a makeshift stage, pushed against the railing that overlooks the seawall. Hey, Antonio, look, it's Ms. Waddles. A diminutive and energetic woman stands atop the stage, making sweeping gestures with both arms in the direction of the gathered townsfolk. She wears a billowy white shirt beneath a dark bodice which flows into a conservative black dress. Her hair is haphazardly piled on top of her head. A couple of hardworking hairpins are holding everything precariously in place. The stage is decorated with a string of brightly colored paper flags suspended from a set of tall poles which lean against the guardrail. Mrs. Waddle's voice becomes more audible as they do near. A voice for the city center is a voice to strengthen the foundation of the moral bedrock of the community, she shouts to the crowd. Beside her, a rickety easel supports a hand-painted poster board which reads, Take action. Vote for Jenny Bay Initiative 1, a civic center for the entire community, sponsored by the Jetty Bay Ladies Auxiliary. She hands brochures to everyone gathered before her, and they begin to dis dissipate. Antonio seizes the momentary lull in the patter to acknowledge their presence. Hello, Mrs. Waddles. He calls with a wave in her direction. Oh, hello, Peta boys, said Mrs. Waddles from her platform. What a wonderful day for democracy. Be sure to remind your parents to vote for the Civic Center measure today, Initiative 1. She hands the boys each a handwritten brochure. It's an exact replica of the text on the poster board, along with the slogans Mrs. Waddles had been orating. Thanks, Mrs. Waddles. We will. Nathaniel smiles and folds the brochure into his knapsack. More people start to gather around Mrs. Waddles to fill in the gap. She resumes her campaign to the new bodies. A vote for the Civic Center is a vote to strengthen the foundation of the moral bedrock of the community, Mrs. Waddles begins again. Her voice fades as the brothers continue to walk. Antonio glances down the boardwalk. Just beyond the marina looms the old Jetty Bay Armory that seems to occupy everyone's mind at the moment. The building has been derelict for many years. In its heyday, it served as a supplier of munitions for naval ships during the Revolution. Oh, Nathaniel! cries Antonio, noticing a figure running toward them in the distance. Who's that barreling toward us at full steam? Nathaniel places his hand against his brow line to shield his eyes from the sunny glare. Uh, it's Wally Nelson! He announces. He sure looks thrilled about something, doesn't he? Waldorf Nelson Jr. grew up just down the lane from the Petaboys and is one of the museum's most frequent and enthusiastic visitors. His family owns and operates a small farm on the outskirts of town, a little under a mile and a half away from Pettitshire. His grandparents were instrumental in the foundation of Jetty Bay in the 19th century. While the Nelson name is not as prominent today, it remains well respected due to their earnest, if somewhat hapless, disposition and strong passion for civic matters. Wally is just a grade below Nathaniel in school. However, their friendship is founded mostly on Wally's proximity, ever present around his home. Over the years, they'd all become good chums. Hey guys! Shouts Wally. Why, I'm glad to see you! He puffs and swallows hard as he catches his breath. Hi, Wally, how you been? Calls oh. Antonio. I'm swell. Pants Wally. Yeah. Hey, remember how I told you I wanted to search for Spanish doubloons? He stares wide-eyed at the brothers. Well, I was just beach coming down under the pier, and you'll never believe what I found. Well, did you find a doubloon, Wally? Asked Nathaniel. Well, I didn't. Wally rocks back on his heels. Well, what did you find, Wally? Asked Antonio politely. 
Oh boy, oh boy, you just have to come and see. Come down to the beach for a minute. He exclaims. Oh, I wish we could. Antonio responds. Oh, we're on our way down to the station to see our brother in Montgomery. Aw, oh, come on, you guys. Please, Wally. You're really going to want to see this. Well, what is it, Wally? Demands Nathaniel. Wally's eyes grow wide again. I don't know. Something shining like well, as bright as I've ever seen. Well, I almost got it out on my own, but I couldn't quite lift the rockets under. Well, I need your help. Well, maybe we can help you when we get back. Antonio offers. We're only going to be gone for a few hours. Well, you guys don't understand. The tide's coming in. I don't think we'll be able to get to it when you get back. Says Wally, shifting anxiously as he peers into the bay. Antonio scratches his ear and glances in the direction of the station. He looks again at Wally and Nathaniel. Well, I guess we could catch the next train. Antonio reasons with a slight wince. I think there's one at 9.45. Oh, boy! Squeals Wally, elated. Chapter 6, Wally's Discovery. The end of the boardwalk is capped by a concrete pillar and alcove overlooking giant stone breakers placed against the seawall. The pillar features a plaque with vast relief sculpture of a narwhal, the official insignia of Deddy Bay. It marks a large opening in the guardrail onto the seashore. The smooth wall hugs a trail of steps cast into the hardy concrete wall. The last step is partially submerged in the pebbles and sand on the beach. A pungent scent of seaweed baking in the morning sun wafts on the breeze. The stones crunch beneath their shoes slowing the pace as they move. Tiny sand fleas leap in every direction, heralding the arrival of visitors. Well, come on, guys! Wally cries. He leads the way beneath the old armory, which extends at least 100 feet from the seawall over the water on thick creosote-covered pilings. This allows loading and unloading of cargo without the need for ships to dock at the marina. The further the pilings are from the seawall, the more crusted with mussels and barnacles each of them seem to be. Most are sturdy and solid, but a few seem precariously decayed from years of exposure to the swirling salty water. I was walking along the seawall, and then I decided to see what I could find beneath the pier that runs under the old armory. And then I saw it! Five Swally. The boys navigate over piles of large, jagged rocks on the shore beneath the armory. Wally fixes his gaze on the ground. Every couple of steps he crouches, peers expectantly into the cracks and gaps formed among the piles. Antonio draws a frustrated breath. But what, Wally? What did you see? He demands. Wally steadies his footing on the top of a large flat stone. He kneels, bracing himself with both of his hands. He lowers his face until it is level with the bottom of the rock. That! Wally points to the crack between a couple of hefty boulders. And Tony and Nathaniel hop on adjacent rocks and hunch around Wally. A bright gleam of white light flashes from the point where Wally stares. Golly, gasped Nathaniel. Is it sea glass? Well, I thought so too at first, counters Wally. But I've never seen sea glass sparkle like that. Hmm, it's wedged pretty far down between those two rocks, Antonia observes. Nathaniel, what do you think? Can, can we get it out of there? Nathaniel leans back and assesses the scene. Hmm. Between the three of us, well, let's see if we can shift it, he suggests. All three boys position themselves around the rock and place their hands against the side. <laughs> <laughs> they grunt collectively. The rock barely budges. Well, it's no use. Oh, well. Sighs Wally, dejected. Uh, well, let's see, says Antonio, testing the size of the rock with the toe of his shoe. Oh, maybe we can try rocking it or something. He finds a spot that makes the rock wiggle when he puts his weight down. Nathaniel keeps a wary eye on the glittering treasure. Okay, well, let's be sure it doesn't fall any further. He turns to Wally, currently crouched down with hands on his knees. Wally, can you spit out your gum? Wally blinks in mild embarrassment. 
Oh, gee. Well, sorry, guys. I know, I know you don't like it when I chew on gum. He adds bashfully. He retrieves a small wad of chewing gum from his mouth with his fingers. He cups his hand and covers it with a handkerchief pulled from the front pocket of his knickers. He sets the gum in the center. No, no, no. I need it, says Nathaniel. Nathaniel drags a skinny, sun-bleached piece of driftwood from where it had settled against the seawall. Here, stick it on the end of this branch I found. If you can get the gum to stick to it, I bet we can fish it out. Wally places his gum at the tip of the outstretched branch. Antonio stands with his back facing the rock. He wraps his fingers along the bottom side. Okay, I think I got a grip on the edge. He squats deeply and adjusts his feet for maximum stability. Here goes. His legs straighten and he leans into the rock as he pushes. Nathaniel readies the now sticky driftwood branch. Carefully, carefully. He urges. Nathaniel positions the tip of the stick near the source of the sparkle. He inches closer and closer. Antonio can feel his left foot slipping against the smooth face of the stone he'd chosen as a brace. He tries to adjust his grip, but it's too late. Look out! I can't hold it! He shouts. Slam! Antonio lurches backwards as the rock falls. It lands squarely on the driftwood branch, forcefully freeing it from Nathaniel's hands. Whoops, sorry guys, says Antonio with a disappointed grimace. Well, it was worth a shot, answers Wally, trying to muster a half smile. No, wait, says Nathaniel. I can use the stick as a lever here. He presses the end of the stick downward. It is now a perfect lever. This time, the rock rises easily. With trepidation, Wally scuttles beside the newly created gap and extends his hand as far as he can. Fellas! He cries. I got it! He examines the new discovery in the palm of his hand. It's a gemstone. See, guys? Wally holds the stone between his index finger and thumb and raises it into the sunlight. Gee. I thought it would have gotten smashed when I dropped the rock, but it doesn't look like the impact hurt it at all. Marvels Antonio. Well, maybe it's a diamond. Nathaniel postulates. Oh, quit fooling, guys, says Wally incredulously. Like Wally Nelson's going to find a diamond the size of a spice drop under the boardwalk. Well, there's got to be someone who could tell us for sure. Reasons Nathaniel. You know, says Antonio. There's bound to be a mineralogist at the university. Why don't you come along with us to Montgomery, Wally? Wally's face gleams with a mosaic of angular reflections from the facets of his new treasure. Well, okay. Well, that sounds swell. He chirps with delight. Hey, brother. Nathaniel interjects. If we expect to catch the train, we better hoof it. Oh, yeah. And Tony replies hastily. Let's go. Chapter 7, Jetty Bay Train Station. Antonio and Nathaniel zigzag along through the avenues of downtown Jetty Bay as merchants add finishing touches to ready the day's wares. Townsfolk emerge from sleepy neighborhoods for an early start on their daily errands. While it trails a few yards behind, struggling at times to keep pace, they scurry between pedestrians and signboards. They hurry up Broad Street until the intersection of 6th Avenue. They observe the train station clock tower sprouting from a tidy iron fence flanking the sidewalk. The fence spans several blocks surrounding the rail yard. The boys weave between automobiles and buggies as they cross the avenue. The hands on the tower clock point to 9 and 23 after. Only a few minutes to spare. A hot blast erupts impatiently from the whistle on the cab of a chuffing locomotive. Thick billows of steam swirl across the platform, constrained by the awning covering the walkway. The boys rush through the open gates under the maroon awning of the depot. They leap over swirling geometric patterns on the polished marble floor of the waiting room. The luggage steward behind the counter purses his lips in disapproval of the boys' reckless haste. Antonio skids to a stop and holds his arms out to slow his companions before the ticket window. The attendant flashes three tickets in her hand, having observed the boy's determination to reach the window. Antonio withdraws two dollars from his billfold and slaps them on the counter. 
The attendant issues three tickets to Montgomery. Thank you kindly, yells Antonio. He gently grabs his brother's shoulder and without waiting for change, starts toward a large door marked to trains in large red letters. Nathaniel and Wally followed shortly after him. They fling themselves around the gate onto the platform. All aboard, shouts the conductor, leaning forward from a passenger car. Step lively, Wally, Nathaniel prods. We gotta make this train. Wally gasps for air. I'm going as fast as I can. Antonio picks up speed as the conductor bends over and pulls the steps away from the hissing train. I think we're just going to make it. Antonio declares triumphantly. As Antonio and Nathaniel shoot forward, Wally takes a very deep breath. He clutched, clenches his eyes shut and raises his nose into the air. Then with all his might, he charges forward using every last ounce of energy he can muster. The conductor spots them and motions them forth. <laughs> Almost immediately, Wally smacks into a thin man dressed in an ill-fitting brown suit. Oh, hey, sorry, mister. Wally says, opening his eyes. Well, I guess I didn't see you. He dusts off his pant legs. The man grimaces at Wally and brushes both of his jacket sleeves with a plain handkerchief. No, oh, I uh, forget it, kid. The man replies brusquely. He turns his back to the boys and walks up toward the station along the platform. Are you okay, you okay? Wally? Asks Antonio. He pats Wally on the shoulder. They approach passenger car 37, as indicated on each of the tickets. Yeah, I'm okay. It was nothing. Says Wally. Let's find our seats. They ascend the steps, hanging onto a thin metal rail as they climb. The conductor pulls a chain over the doorway and the train inches forward. An enormous smoky white cloud envelops the platform as the locomotive slowly gains momentum. The smoke quickly dissipates, leaving two men talking to one another at the end of the platform. The young man is the same fellow Wally collided into moments before. The old other man looks much older. His face is carved into a leathery, no-nonsense scowl. Did you get it? Growls the short man. No. Says the skinny man. Are you sure that's the kid we saw around at the boardwalk this morning? Yeah, that's him, all right. Uh, he slipped by too quick. The thin man complains, but those were... But those were definitely the two boys I saw snooping around at the fort last night. Should we try and catch them on the train? Nah, replies the short man, spitting a frayed toothpick onto the train tracks. There's no time for that now. We have to check in at 9.30. I overheard the older one say that they had only been gone for a couple of hours. Oh, uh, well, okay. We'll have to try again tonight. Says the young man in an attempt to appear confident. The short man clutches the flappy lapels of the tall man's jacket in his fists. We can't let that diamond get away if HMB is going to put us through a meat grinder if he finds we lost that rock. After a few seconds, his face relaxes and he releases his grip on the tall man's lapels. He straightens the terrified tall man's tie and smooths the back of his jacket. The two of them walk toward the exit gate to the city. Chapter 8 Nor'easter Express Commuter Line. Well, do you really think the ballots you found were for the election? The one today, I mean? Asks Wally. He squirms in place in his seat. Well, yeah, I'm sure they had today's date on them. Returns Antonio from the seat across the aisle from Wally and Nathaniel. Well, I thought it was pretty suspicious, too. The three chums are seated in row G of a modestly appointed passenger car. The cabin is full of thick polished paneling and dark wooden trim. The train speeds along the coastline of the eastern seaboard. This morning, the train is mostly occupied by commuters with business in other towns, but on the weekends, the cars are typically packed with jubilant students coming home from Bryler University in Montgomery. Hmm, there's got to be some connection, reasons Nathaniel. Antonio rummages through his knapsack and pulls out a neatly folded sheet of paper. And check out this note we found. He passes the note to his brother. 
Nathaniel unfolds it carefully before handing it to Wally. With the note held in front of him with both hands, Wally studies the letters carefully, sounding out each word with his lips as he reads. After several moments, he lowers his hands and turns to the brothers. Mm, gee, well, it doesn't make much sense to me. His eyes return to the paper. Uh, do you know who any of these guys are? The note names several men, referring to them by their initial only. We're not sure just yet. Antonio leans into the aisle, retrieving the note, his eyes narrow. We're beginning to suspect this has something to do with the election today. He refolds the note and replaces it in the knapsack. We just ran into Mrs. Wiles from the ladies' auxiliary, and she is all excited about the city turning the armory over uh, to use as a new community center. Shouts Nathaniel. Wally's eyes grow wide. Well, and, and was it? He asks breathlessly. Well, we don't know, Wally. Well, nobody is supposed to know until after the results are all tallied, and voting didn't start until this morning. And if those ballots we found were already punched last night... Antonio interjects eagerly. Well, they might have been stolen or, or forged or, or who knows? Wally sat upright in his seat. So? He beams, mirroring Antonio's enthusiasm. His head tilts slightly and his expression changes. Wait, what, what does that mean? Well, we're not sure, Wally. Nathaniel continues. I mean, why would anyone go to all the trouble of forging ballots? The approaching staccato pulse of a railway crossing bell catches the boy's attention. They stare through the windows at the passing scenery. To the right, scrubby green clumps of eelgrass bow to the train's presence. They sway among the sands of a thin slice of beach carved out along the railroad tracks. Beyond the shore, the emerald blue ocean water shimmers toward the horizon. On the opposite side, a bright meadow speckled with patches of colorful wildflowers. Dairy cows nibble languidly on new blades of grass still dappled by the dew. They seem unimpressed by the locomotive's might and roar and allow the train to chug through their territory unabated. Antonio, you think the ladies auxiliary is trying to tip the results in their favor? Asked Nathaniel, breaking the momentary silence. Well, it seems like a lot of trouble to go to. Antonio replies. Besides, you heard what Mom said. Everyone she knows is planning to vote for it. We just got to try to figure out what's going on. Willikers! Wally gasps. Well, you boys aren't going to be getting into any trouble, are you? No, I don't think so, Wally. Assures Antonio. Dad said not to go making a big deal out of nothing. Uh, hey, Antonio. Says Nathaniel, changing the subject. What's in the package that Mom gave you to give to Chris? Say, I'm not sure, replies Antonio. He produced the parcel with which his mother entrusted him this morning from the empty seat beside him. It was wrapped in plain round butcher paper and tied with a length of sturdy twine. He brought the box next to his left ear and rattled the box gently with both hands. Sounds like it's maybe some cookies, snickers Antonio. Well, but, uh, cookies, clatters Wally. Can I have some fat? No, Wally, I was just fun in you. To Antonio Josh's. I think it's a new pair of shoes for our brother. Wally's face sinks with disappointment. Aww. He again turns his attention to the view outside the train car. The train plunges into a tunnel, extinguishing the bright countryside from view. Lamps dotting the cabin with ceiling reveal that they had been lit for the duration of the trip, but the reason now is only apparent. Absent any activity, Wally starts to kick his legs back and forth. The glittering stone in his pocket takes the opportunity to make an escape. It falls between the seats and drops to the floor below his seat. Wally twists and squirms until he faces the back of his chair. Pressing his knees into the seat cushion, his legs sneak beneath the adjacent seat. He grips his armrest and lowers his torso until he's lying prone on the floor of the cabin. He extends his fingers beneath his seat and feels around for his prize. As soon as his fingers can touch, he swats the stone, which rolls into the aisle between the seats. Antonio scoops the stone up, up off the floor and hands it to Wally, who had slithered comfortably back into his seat. 
They pass through the end of the tunnel and the cabin is again bathed in the brilliant morning sunlight. Wally daydreams and admires his find. Just think, with this diamond, I could buy a new bike. No, a hundred bikes, land some taffy. Well, hey, you better stop fooling around with that stone, Wally. Antonio warns. Or you're going to lose it. Unperturbed, Wally waxes further. And I can visit Yukon territory. And well, you won't be able to get any of that if you lose it before we can get it looked at. Antonio offers sternly. No, oh, come on. Protests Wally. I could never lose a treasure like this. Well, somebody did. Otherwise, you wouldn't be sitting here trying to lose it now. Oh, you guys! Clucks Wally skeptically. The heavy cabin door slides into the wall with a deep and hearty clink. Conductor Higley stoops as he enters the cabin to clear the door frame. The conductor must be at least six foot five and looks very smart in his sharp blue uniform. He withdraws a silver ticket punch from the right pocket of his trousers. Tickets, please, he announces when he reaches the boys. Here you go, sir, says Antonio, fanning the three tickets beneath, between his fingers. The conductor takes the tickets and clips them with his special ticket punch. A small letter M shaped hole is remain, remains on the face of each time. Three for Montgomery, barks the conductor. That's the next stop, boys. Chapter 9, Bryler University. Bryler University is a brisk and pleasant bus ride from the Montgomery train station. The route follows a winding road up the steep hill upon which the university presides proudly. At the top of the hill, the bus meanders through the wizened oak trees lining Greek Row and past stately formal houses inhabited by university faculty. They pass by a gatehouse next to a large wooden sign about the size of the boys' dining room table. Bryler University is carved in Old English script. A formal boulevard is defined by a long row of ancient and gnarled trunks of oak trees. The canopies of the trees blend into thick archways of emerald green. Between the tree trunks, the open stretch of lawn the students call the quad. It expands before the ivy-shrouded brick walls of the old main building. The bus pulls up beside a small newsstand on the sidewalk before the quad and growls softly as the bus driver opens the door. Antonio, Nathaniel, and Wally each salute the driver in acknowledgement as they step off the bus. He tips his hat in return as he shuts the doors and then resumes his course. Though summer, the campus is still bustling with students taking classes over vacation. Students without classes this hour take full advantage of sitting on the sunny quad for study or, more likely, socializing gaily. The history department building is located across the campus square from the lecture hall. The boys approach the fountain in the center of the square when a voice calls out from behind a column of dancing water. Goora, goora, sis boomba. The boys swivel their heads and race around the fountain to greet a young man in dapper linen pants and a crisp collared shirt who waves at them. Hi, guys, Chris exclaims. Antonio and Nathaniel run straight for their brother. Chris glances at each of his brothers squarely and thrusts his hand before them. Antonio places his hand on top. Likewise, follows Nathaniel before their arms rise into the air. Their hands swoop inward until each brother holds the wrist of another. They glare seriously at one another, then break into peals of laughter and roughhousing. Thanks for coming all the way up to the campus, welcomes Chris, still laughing. Is this little Wally Nelson? He lands a playful, playful punch on Wally's shoulder. Oh, oh, Chris. Wally says stalwartly. Well, I'm not so little anymore. Chris sizes the young man in front of him. I guess not, he agrees. Antonio produces the paper wrap package he carried throughout the morning. Mom gave, Mom gave us this package to oh, give to you. Sorry. <laughs> Chris inspects the wrapping and shakes the box gently. We don't even know what's in there. Offers Wally. I mean, 
There's certainly not cookies or anything. Let's have a look, said Chris, pulling the twine knot loose. He peels the bush of paper from the container and hands it to Antonio. Chris laughs as he peers inside and pauses in incredulously. Mom sent you all the way here to give me these? Well, what is it? Asked Wally eagerly. Antonio lifts a little, little further. Well, it's shoes and some shoe polish. Mom just sent me a new pair not three months ago, Chris balks. I don't know what she thinks I'm doing up here, but I'm not going through shoes that fast. Chris closes the shoebox and they walk toward a cluster of buildings at the end of a long brick pathway. Antonio neatly folds the butcher paper wrapping into a square and smooths the creases between his fingertips absentmindedly as they stroll. Say, Antonio, pipes Nathaniel after observing his brother's fastidious creasing. Ask him about the fort. Oh yeah, Chris, what do you know about old Fort Bowden up on the bluff above town? Antonio queries. Chris scratches his goatee. Hmm, Fort Bowden. I happen to know quite a bit about it. Let's get back to my office and I can show you a few things. Great. Beams Antonio. Chris pulls the po polished brass handle of the heavy door set beneath the deep Gothic arches of the history building. He motions the boys through the entrance and they emerge in a long, ruddy hallway running the length of the building. Their footsteps echo brightly as they traverse the linoleum, a checkerboard of maroon and mustard colored tile. At the end of the hall, beside a framed billboard, Chris turns the handle on a humble wooden door. It contains a pane of frosted glass in its upper third. The boys file into the classroom. Antonio, Nathaniel, and Wally each sit at desks in the front row. Chris walks to the head of the class and picks up a chunk of white chalk. Yeah, so Fort Bowden was built for the Revolutionary War, and it was a military lookout, and it defended a trading post, outpost, which was located at what's now downtown Jetty Bay. There was a huge battle where the British mercenaries blasted a big hole in the side, and it was never repaired, and they abandoned it when the war was over. When it was operational, it most likely did a lot of trading with the town below. He scribbled each point on the chalkboard. His voice pauses as his hand catches up each sentence. Well, that makes sense, says Antonio, shifting posture in his chair. Although we didn't see any roads or anything connecting it to town, we only found it because we were up to that lake and we stumbled across it. Well, Chris continues, they wouldn't have used roads because of the steep elevation, but back then it was pretty common to build supply trenches between forts and towns that supplied them. What, you mean like underground? Asked Nathaniel, intrigued, like a tunnel? Like a tunnel? Possibly, responds Chris. Because we were inside... Antonio confides. And, and we saw that big hole in the wall. He slows sheepishly. And I know we're not supposed to open boxes that aren't addressed to us. Okay, and? Interrupts Chris hastily. Oh, we found a box of ballots for today's elections. Antonio exclaims. And this note. Chris unfolds the note and peruses it closely. Hmm, he says after several seconds, still stroking his goatee. One wrong move could jeopardize everything? That's kind of dramatic, isn't it? Chris ponders and studies the note a bit longer. What do you think it means, Chris? Asked Antonio. Sounds like somebody might have been trying to tamper with the election. He taps his index finger on the last word of the next sentence. And also, I wonder what this means by the latest shipment. Oh, yeah, we haven't figured that part out either. We want to go back up there and look for that tunnel. Antonio declares avidly. Oh, where do you, where think, do you it would, think it would come out, Chris? <laughs> Chris walks across the classroom and pulls a tall leather bound book from a squat bookshelf by a dormant radiator. He drops the book on the cold slate bench before the brothers. Thump. Maps of the eastern seaboard is embossed in flaky gold leaf. Chris thumbs through the pages until landing upon a map of Jetty Bay and the surrounding area. He locates a tiny dot on the map labeled Fort Bowden between two of the skinny contour lines on the ridge. 
from the bluff, it would probably end up somewhere on the North Bay, maybe downtown. He traces a perimeter around the fort with his pointer finger. It would probably have to end up the waterfront with access to the bay for shipping and supplies and stuff. His finger slides to the shoreline near a nest of lines representing the streets of downtown Jetty Bay. Hey, well, we were just down at the waterfront today, chimes Nathaniel. Oh, yeah, Chris. Antonio agrees. Oh, get a load of what Wally found under the boardwalk by the old armory. The bo brothers turn to face Wally expectantly. Wally stared blankly for a moment, not expecting to find himself at the center of tension. Uh, oh, oh, yeah, I almost forgot. Wally plunged his right hand into the front pocket of his knickers. He withdraws a tight fist and thrusts it into the morning sunlight streaming across the windows. He carefully cups the treasure in his palm. Prismatic reflections scatter across his face and throughout every corner of the room. Wow, Chris gasps. Wally, what you got there? It's a diamond, declares Wally triumphantly. It might be a diamond, Antonio stipulates. And it'd sure be a big one. Chris is momentarily stunned. So, so you guys, you just found this? Somebody's got to be missing that. A low rumble of activity slowly, slowly builds behind the frosted glass pane at the door. Students empty into the hallway from classrooms at the top of the hour. Chris glances at his pocket watch and slips it into his front trouser pocket. I know someone in the geosciences department who I think would be very interested in seeing this. Chris turns to Wally as he flips the heavy cover of the map book closed. A cloud of dust erupts from the packet pages, momentarily making the sun's path visible through the particle. You want to go and find out what it is, he asks. Uh, sure. I mean, I guess, says Wally, again caught off guard. He again shoves the stone into his pocket. Chris holds the door open for the boys and they merge into the now crowded hallway. The geosciences department is located directly above the history department on the second floor. It is accessed by a bright stairwell with picture, glass, picture window glass at the opposite end of the hallway. At the top of the stairs, the boys again traverse the length of the building to reach the geosciences department. Case upon case of mounted rock and mineral samples hang from the walls. The labels are old and faded. An untrained eye could be forgiven for overlooking the rare samples, most of which appear dull and unspectacular. They turn a corner and enter a spacious, if cluttered laboratory. At the far edge of the wall, a slight woman is seated on a stool before a workbench raised to eye level. A pair of lenses attached to the frame of her glasses magnify a mallet and a tiny chisel she uses to chip into the sample before her. A metallic note rings a sharp staccato with each minuscule strike. She does not seem to take notice of Chris and the boys as they approach, remaining steadfast in her task. Julia Amsler, PhD, Diane and Terror. Good afternoon, Dr. Amsler, says Chris, clearing his throat. Do you have a moment? Dr. Amsler rests her tools on the bench and looks up, still wearing magnifying goggles over her spectacles. She held, tilts her head back and squints through the thick lenses. An enormous pair of steely blue eyes blink twice at the boys, greatly enlarged by the magnification. She wrinkles her nose and squints harder in puckered confusion. She pulls the goggles from her face with both hands and brushes her eyelid with the back of her fingers. She pauses and gathers composure, drawing a short, sharp breath. Oh, hello, adjunct Professor Pettit. Miss Dr. Amsler gasps, eyesight now restored. I'd like you to meet my brothers, Antonio and Nathaniel, Chris announces, and their friend Wally. Antonio steps forward and extends his palm to the professor. She grasps it in her slender, work-worn fingers and squeezes it tightly with both hands. Pleased to meet you, Professor. How do you do, Professor? Adds Nathaniel. Dr. Amsler squeezes Nathaniel's hand and cups her fingers against the side of his face. This is our... This is our friend Wally. Notes Nathaniel. Uh, hello there, Professor. The professor smiles warmly in his direction. 
Uh, hello. <laughs> Wally. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Professor, says Chris. He rests his foot on the footrest of the high stool. The boys have brought something with him today, and I think you might find it quite interesting. Professor answers, wry expression signals her intrigue. All eyes turn expectantly to Wally. Wally nods his head slowly and winks confidently. He pats the inside of his pocket on his pant leg. Well, go ahead and show her, Wally. Antonio prods. Wally's gaze turns skyward and he plucks the stone from his pocket. Pinching it between his thumb and finger, he admires it closely against the light. My goodness! Dr. Amster gasps in astonishment. Here, let me have a look at that, Wally. Wally presents the find in his outstretched palm. Dr. Amster takes a pair of long tweezers and moves the jewel to her brightly lit workbench. No, no. let me see. She mutters, half to herself. Her hands dart between compartments built into the cabinet above her work surface, each filled with neatly ordered chisels, brushes, tweezers, and tongs. In the right hands, this arsenal of precision tools can transform rough, uncut rocks into sought-after gemstones. She pulls a magnifying loop from the chain around her neck and keenly inspects the sparkling facets of the stone. That's a find, boys. Dr. Amster pulls a small black box from the shelf and delicately coaxes a thin strip of glass from a neat row of slides. She draws the gem against the surface. Hmm, this is a diamond, all right. See how it scratches the glass? She shows the boy markings left on the glass and compares it with another strip, noting the hardness of various minerals. That you've got here, let's just put it on the scale, Wally. Dr. Amster places the stone on a set of scales. With an honest to goodness, round cut. She fiddles with the weights on the balance beam of the scale as she speaks. Eighteen carats! A diamond of this size and clarity could only have come from the Horn of Africa. My word, how did you find this stone? Wally taps his lower lip and thinks for a moment. Well, I woke up this morning and I said to myself, Wally, I think today's a good day to go out and look for Spanish doubloons. So I set off for the beach, and I got real close to the ground, and I started to look around. Wally's eyes grow large, and he imitates searching the ground. At first, I started digging holes, but you know why? He halts patiently. Dr. Amster waits a beat. Ah, uh, that's that, Wally, she asks. Well, I didn't have a treasure map, exclaims Wally, as though still surprised by this fact. Okay, coaxes the doctor. So, I figured I'd better see if I could spot any signs of old treasure chests. But there, were, there were no signs of any balloons or treasure chests. Just a bunch of old scratchy barnacle rocks. So, I decided to head back into town. So I was walking along the seawall, and then I ran into these guys. Wally declares proudly. The group stares expectantly at Wally. Uh, Wally, you forgot one thing. Antonio beckons. What's that? Asks Wally, arching his brows. Well, you left out where you found the diamond. Nathaniel offers encouragingly. Wally's eyes light up. Oh, yeah! He shouts. Regaining his enthusiasm, I was walking to that was old dock. I was that old dock that goes out from the armory, and I saw something wedged between a couple of rocks really tight. Literally anything. And I knew I had to get it. But, but I couldn't get it. Well, not without help anyway. So that's when I decided to head back into town. And then I ran into these guys. Well, he extends both hands for dramatic effect, signaling the end of his story. Dr. Amster draws a deep breath. What Wally is trying to say, Dr. Amsler. Oh. What Wally is trying to say, Dr. Amsler. Nathaniel mercifully interjects. Is that he found it beneath the boardwalk under the old armory on the waterfront, and we helped him to get it out. The professor examines the gem under her jeweler's loop. Mm. A gem like this must have a proper owner. You should probably keep an eye out for any posters calling for a missing diamond when you get back home. 
Neither way. It would be best if you put this in a safe deposit box until we can notify the proper authorities about your find. All his face sinks. Oh, you mean I don't get to keep it? He pleads bashfully. Yeah, I'm afraid not, my boy. I... Advises Dr. Amsler. Out of this quality and size? Well, even I would be hard pressed to produce such a fine gem. I'd eventually guess I'd say it was worth something on the order of at least five thousand dollars. That's not a prize that someone would part with lightly. When we get back into town, we could stop by your dad's bank and you could deposit it in the vault. Suggests Antonio. Wallace smiles in agreement. Oh, okay, that's a swell idea. Well, thanks for helping us out, Professor Amser, ma'am. Says so Antonio. Dr. Answer steps off of her stool and gathers his stray tools in her workbench. Now you hold on to that diamond, she warns with playful seriousness. The boys return to the again busy hallway on the way out of the geosciences department. Hey guys, I gotta head back to my office, says Chris, as they return down the steps to the main entrance. Make sure to say hi to the folks for me. Chris holds the door open for the boys. And Wally, good luck hunting down the rightful owner of that rock. Oh, thanks for everything, big brother, says Antonio. Well, tell Mom and Pie you said hello, adds Nathaniel. After waving farewell, the three friends wind their way back to the station. A cloud of white steam erupts as the express locomotive southbound speeds toward downtown Jetty Bay and destinations beyond. All right. Nice. Wow. That concludes today's episode. Yeah, right. Well, I, I hope uh, everybody enjoyed the uh, exciting new uh, developments with flashy <laughs> jewelry. and <laughs> wow. Fascinating. Uh, yeah. Fascinating. So yeah, thanks for listening. Um, next week we'll probably be doing something uh, different, and uh, so we'll we'll be coming at you again at 5 p.m. on Sunday. And um, yeah, different material. We're going to take a break from the novel for a bit and try our hand at some other things, and then we'll return yeah. to the novel in a couple putting weeks. The, putting the variety back in variety show. The variety, the variety <laughs> show. Um, so until then, um, we have an entire library of um, materials found on brothercast.net, which you're welcome to explore. Uh, and until the next time we meet, I'm um, wishing you the best of the week. And a safe return to us next time. All right. Yes. <laughs> All right. Good night, everyone. Hey, everybody. Good night. Good night.